What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Today, it is my pleasure to be joined by Alan Flanagan. Alan, how you doing, my man? I'm good, Mike. Thanks for having me on. It is my pleasure. For our listeners who might not already be familiar with you, can you, can you provide us a, a bit of an introduction about, about your background and your current research focus? Yeah, so um, background is uh, a bit of a meander. I, I started out in law um, and I practiced in law for about 10 years, um, but was always really interested in nutrition, um, originally kind of from my own sports and kind of performance interests and then was quite interested in the kind of the academic science side so while I was still working in law I did a master's uh, in nutrition and that was really just out of personal kind of curiosity as the master's was going along I was becoming more interested in research and wanted to try and be involved in research somehow um, whether it meant leaving law or not I hadn't really kind of navigated and then uh, at the end of my MSc, I got offered a full-time PhD. So that was the Rubicon, and I left law, uh, took up the, the full-time doctorate, and that has been focused on chrononutrition, largely timing of food intake and the influence of timing of food intake on metabolic health and the, the relationship between that timing and uh, underlying circadian rhythms. So, yeah, we're two-thirds of the way through, so it's n nearly nearly getting to the home straight. Excellent. Uh, many of our listeners will probably be familiar with you, Alan, due to your frequent appearances on the Sigma Nutrition Podcast, where you and Danny do, do an excellent job of, of doing a comprehensive overview of specific topics. One of your more recent episodes was on uh, long-term weight maintenance, which is a, an especially compelling field when it when it comes to nutrition. I would say this is perhaps our our number one issue as a whole. Uh, it, it seems pretty clear that a variety of diets can generate some substantial weight loss. But mm -hmm. the issue is, how, how do we maintain this weight loss long term? And you and Danny touched on some some absolutely terrific concepts. There's a lot of great information in that episode. So I will link that in the show notes to this discussion. But I want to follow up with you and, and dive a bit deeper into this idea of long term successful weight maintenance and, and what we can do as an industry to perhaps spread some more high quality information and, and, and help increase our rates of success. With that being said, I, I want to perhaps lay out some, some concrete definitions and terms for this discussion. And that is, when we're talking about weight loss, what, what is significant weight loss? And then furthermore, in, in the concept of successful long-term weight maintenance, what, what is long-term? How do we define success in this endeavor? Yeah, I, I think that's one of the, I guess, challenges with a lot of the research out there is because depending on how those two factors are defined, um, what is successful and how long is long term, then it's, it's kind of easy to make a case, A, that there is loads of success, and B, that there is no success. Uh, so generally, from a research perspective, long term is often actually defined as like up to a year which is fairly ludicrous when we think <laughs> about that as a definition um and you know successful is is often defined as you know a kilo range of like three to six or what's become more accepted i think as a target is a minimum of seven percent of initial body weight lost so when you combine those two factors together, on one hand, it can be easy to say that loads of interventions are successful insofar as a substantial proportion of the intervention group may achieve 7% to 10% or maybe more of weight loss of initial as a percentage of initial body weight. And then they may have maintained that I'd say six months or some arbitrary definition of, 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 of success within that year. Of course, this is also why the statistics of, for example, you know, 95% of diets fail are, are able to have some sort of backing 
because inevitably if you try and extrapolate out that follow-up period to maybe two years or whatever you'll typically find that weight has started to be regained almost instantly after the intervention and you'll often find that so little weight was lost in the first place that it's very easy to make it appear that the majority of the weight has been lost uh, and so this is why the absolute amount of weight loss is an important factor to, to tease out because if someone loses four kilos over the course of a six month intervention, that's a fairly terrible return on investment. And if they gained two and a half of that back, you know, we're, we're suddenly able to frame these statistics as well, you know, X amount of diets fail because people gain a majority of the weight back or whatever. Um, you know, now conversely, if someone lost 13 kilos uh, or 15% of their initial body weight and regained four or five, there's still a significant net gain. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of, I guess, um, issues with definitions. Um, but it's, I think, the way that me and Danny certainly kind of tried to discuss it through was that in reality, long term success should be at least over two years and more appropriately four to five years. And it should be defined as maintaining, uh, you know, if say 10 to 15 percent of body weight was lost, you know, maintaining 7 percent or, or plus of, of that. Um, so those definitions are a lot more onerous than some of the shorter term ones. But there is evidence in, for example, the Look Ahead trial or some of Roy Taylor's research groups, uh, interventions for diabetes, that in fact it's, it's achievable. So what's important is how to tease out what factors correlate with, with that uh, achievement uh, and why. And can that be then applied at a kind of at a wider level or form slightly more amenable, effective advice. Excellent. As you mentioned there, you know, we have some discrepancies in, in definitions and perhaps the the percentages that we tend to to the, the failure rate of successful uh, long-term weight loss maintenance. Um, it might not be as high as we might think, but it's probably still pretty high. And it's definitely a challenge for many people. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I, I think this is, this is an extremely broad question, but perhaps whatever immediately comes to your mind, why, why is it so difficult to maintain weight loss in the long term? Perhaps we can immediately jump to the, the physiological consequences of losing a substantial amount of weight, but maybe there are some, some psychological aspects we should be considering more as well. Yeah, I think I think they all kind of tie together. Um, you know, the physiological and the psychological are are kind of impossible to disentangle. Sometimes, I think you know, obviously from the physiological standpoint, in order to create that environment, there has to be an imbalance between energy coming in and energy expended. That's not great <laughs> to sustain over the long term. Um, you know, hunger, uh, appetite, cravings, um, the psychological stress of trying to sustain, um, you know, certain behaviors, or if there's kind of an over-reliance on willpower, um, there's a lot of cognitive effort and, and, and kind of expending cognitive energy on, you know, trying to sustain the intervention. If it's a diet that someone, you know, feels like is eating cardboard, you know, that that's not going to be good over the long term. So, so there's so much that builds into it, um, you know, and there are, yes, the physiological consequences of increased ghrelin, um, you know, gut derived hunger hormone, increased circulating leptin and the effect that that has on uh, appetite and food seeking behaviors. So yeah, there's all those physiological consequences. Um, there are the psychological consequences, like we've mentioned a few. Um, and so, uh, they're, they're all kind of entangled together in, into this reality that is the current food environment as well. So, 
you know, that environment that people face on a, on a day-to-day basis. I think we, particularly in the, in, the, in the health and fitness community, I think people straw man the weight loss argument a bit too much, generally by reference to their own anecdote or that of their clients. And you're generally talking about a population of people who are, you know, gym training five times a week, track calories and macronutrients, prep food, and then assume that because they can do that, that that should mean everyone in the population is able to do it. Um, And it's a really detached um, and in many ways arrogant assumption. Um, And it's not the reality for for most people in the population. Um, And so we have, yeah, the current food environment and the challenges that that presents, a whole heap of socioeconomic and environmental and demographic factors that influence, you know, diet and the immediate surrounding environment. And then on top of that, you have just how physiologically challenging energy restriction over the long term is and, and how psychologically hammering that, that, that can all be then for someone. And so um, I don't think for one second that there's anything easy about weight loss and long-term maintenance in, in, in human beings. Um, you know, we weren't designed to be in an environment of complete food uh, availability, ubiquitous food availability. Um, and we're also subject to very powerful uh, influences on our food preferences and, and food choices by advertising and, and marketing. Um, so yeah, it's it's none of it is easy uh, for people in, in in the real world. I think that's a phenomenal background to bring us into the meat and potatoes of this discussion, where uh, we can dive into into the research to kind of create a a power rankings of sort in terms of which factors really are the most important when it comes to achieving successful long-term weight maintenance and to to begin this unraveling i think it's best to start with specific diets because the the nuts and bolts of this equation i think is where everyone turns their head to first and they think well if i just had the diet then mm. it would then it would work the, my my issue is that I, I don't have the, the optimal diet. I don't know the specific mac- macronutrient breakdown that will inevitably lead to long-term weakness. And unfortunately, as you're going to, I'm sure, dive into, <laughs> this might not exactly be the case. So, Alan, with that being said, can can you describe at large the literature on on the value of the specific diet or, or macronutrient distribution of the diet and how that impacts long-term weight maintenance success. Yeah, so I mean, at this point, we just don't really have any compelling research that would support any given dietary intervention um, other than adherence. Uh, adherence is the commonality characteristic that means why a low fat diet works for some people and a low carb diet works for other people and and what and anything else in a vegan diet and, and everything else so um with that said there are definitely characteristics that can be useful um these characteristics of course can be obtained in any type of diet so uh, the fact that there are characteristics of diet is is useful because it means that you know you can still have a vegan diet that meets these characteristics as much as you could have a lower carbohydrate diet that meets these characteristics. And those characteristics tend to be higher dietary protein intake. Um, certainly, around thirty percent of energy seems to be a threshold at which there seems to be a kind of um, very positive impact on satiety um, and, and hunger and appetite uh, suppression. There tends to be the kind of beneficial thermogenic effect, um, greater absolute weight loss if a high protein diet is compared to a low protein diet, independent of the balance of carbohydrate and fat, high dietary fiber intake, providing also additional satiety, 
uh, low volume foods. So, you know, leafy greens and foods that can be consumed in a lot of volume, but don't add a lot of calories. Um, and there may be some emerging evidence for distribution of energy as well. There's some evidence that having a lot of energy early in the day can, can continue to suppress ghrelin beyond the period of weight loss. So factoring in those characteristics, I think they're really where, you know, a majority of the focus could be. Um, and those characteristics can, can largely be obtained independent of the kind of wider composition uh, of the diet. Um, but beyond that, as far as, you know, a, this diet versus diet, you know, another diet, there really isn't anything compelling uh, other than the commonality of an energy deficit and a high level of adherence to whatever that diet happens to be. What about for physical activity? I think exercise is the next place that t people tend to go and that's, you know, they might think to themselves, well, uh, some extremely high levels of physical activity are inevitable inevitably going to be required for for the maintenance of weight loss in the long term um can you discuss whether that might be true or not and then on top of it is exercise more important during weight maintenance compared to weight loss or vice versa or is exercise pretty much the value of it pretty consistent despite the phase you're in um i mean you you could argue that it is more useful in maintenance but i i think uh largely that's splitting hairs and exercise is beneficial at any stage um there's obviously an additional energy expenditure component to exercise although the magnitude of that tends to be overestimated by people generally um but it's more, it seems to be anyway, more a correlation of the kind of intent and purposeful behavior of, of engaging in exercise. Um, and that as a behavior uh, and the intentionality of that behavior does seem to be really consistently associated with, uh, with, with greater maintenance. And there's beneficial effects of exercise on hunger and appetite the general assumption that oh, if you exercise you're generally hungrier is not necessarily the case at all what you tend to see is better appetite regulation as opposed to uh you know a kind of increase or, or decrease in hunger it's simply better appetite regulation overall so there potentially is a knock-on effect of exercise on overall eating behavior but then there's also the physiological benefits and otherwise and it also likely correlates highly with engaging in a number of purposeful health promoting behaviors that then together as a composite set of behaviors to influence the long-term outcome i'm not sure if there's any direct research on this but this comes to mind is that you mentioned, and I've seen this data as well, that exercise can can do a, a good job of, of regulating appetite and hunger. But then on the other side of the coin, considering our modern food environment and that, you know, basically anytime we're out in public or we're on social media, we're going to be seeing advertisements for these hyper palatable foods uh, that are pretty affordable and, and, and tasty. And, and for that reason, though we might not necessarily be hungry physiologically if we see these things, we're going to want to go and eat these foods. And for that reason, I think that perhaps some people might use exercises of reward for these types of foods. And they might think, well, I just had an, an hour resistance training session or I, I just ran a mile. I, I've earned I've earned the right to eat one of these energy dense hyper mm. options. Ha have you seen any research about, you know, the, the psychology of people are more likely to choose one of these foods um, following exercise or maybe because they're exercising, they kind of have this whole shift in their mindset about an overall healthy lifestyle and it makes them more likely to choose more healthful options, actually. I, I haven't seen any data that specific to like exercise and the impact that that has and whether someone for example selects you know fast food as a kind of but there is uh, a lot of research on 
uh, food reward um, and the use of food as a reward, and it's it's not positive research. Although, you know, it's important to state that you know food can be a, a kind of valid coping mechanism um, as a behavior, and that's fine. But that's kind of getting into a, a bit of a different realm. Um, the the use of food as a reward um, is generally not something that that has um, is occurring in the the context of overall like health promoting behaviors and a healthy relationship with food. Um, so insofar as that could be the case, the kind of deliberate using of, of food as a reward, I, I imagine, is independent of exercise. Whether they're using it as a reward for, you know getting up and going to work um you know it's it's generally not something that correlates with with kind of overall health promoting behaviors and, and positive outcomes so i can see it potentially being you know a, a kind of a negative a net negative behavior if that is the case great you mentioned the the relationship with food there and we covered how the specific diet or the macronutrient distribution might not matter much as long as you know we're keeping protein and fiber relatively high those seem to be good ideas within those confines does a an individual's attitude toward food influence the potential for uh, weight maintenance success in the long term so that is if they have a, a more flexible diet or flexible attitude towards food and they incorporate um, you know these less healthy options in moderation th does that seem to influence success a bit more positively or uh, is a more rigid approach kind of doing your best to exclude these options which can you know result in excess energy consumption a better idea mm -hmm. no I mean I think it's pretty clear that rigid restraint is uh, strongly, and dietary inhibition um, is strongly associated with, you know, rebound weight gain and and uh, kind of poor relationship with food. And and by dietary inhibition, uh, disinhibition. Sorry, I mean the idea of framing a food as like a, a bad and putting a kind of moral value on it, such that. If someone eats that food, they tend to over overeat as a result because they've now lost their inhibition that they had trying to restrain from consuming whatever this particular food happens to be. So that's quite clearly and consistently going right the way back to the 1990s um, associated with, with, with negative outcomes. Um, within that, there's a constructs that's on the same spectrum known as flexible restraint um, and that tends to be generally associated with with better outcomes um, flexible restraint generally associated with kind of compensatory behaviors as opposed to just pure and utter rigid restraint and in one three-year study it was the lean habit study they looked at a number of behaviors um, and how that correlated and, and people with, they listed eight different behaviors, people with all eight behaviors, um, but that consistently moved from a more rigid place to a, a flexible place were the ones that associated with weight loss maintenance at, at three years. Interestingly, when you look at research that quantifies dietary restraint at before an intervention, you see that the people who almost immediately start regaining weight are people that had high dietary restraint scores, rigid restraint scores at the start. So this also implies that a lot of people in, in nutrition interventions are, are already in a place where they're struggling with their relationship with food, which really is a breach of duty of care that they're even put in an intervention then in the first place. But that's 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 an issue that the field really has 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 to own a bit more. Um, the lack of screening for these factors is, is, is a big issue, I think, and a, a bit of a bit of a black mark on nutrition as, as a field. But anyway, the spectrum of rigid restraint to flexible restraint is is quite clear. They're not separate constructs cognitively. So it someone can shift from one end of the spectrum to the other. And, and that kind of shift is generally associated with um, you know, greater likelihood of, of maintenance than a rigid uh, restraint or dietary disinhibition. 
Now, we are talking about averages here with the research tends to find. I, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting and perhaps we're stepping outside of the research setting here and diving into some anecdotes, but nonetheless, I think they are uh, kind of interesting things to consider. And that is, do, do you think that there are some individuals who inherently benefit more from a rigid approach? Um, when, when I look to social media, and I know you'll be familiar with this as well, if we look into the, you know, keto or carnivore tribe, it seems like we have a bunch of these, you know, N equals one experiments. And you see, again, it, it depends how we define long term, right? But you'll see mm -hmm. these people who have been on these very restrictive diets long term, maybe, you know, they've been doing it for, they've been keto for around five years. And, you know, they report that this, this is the way that they are able to maintain a healthy body weight, they have to completely completely exclude all of these, you know, processed, hyper-palatable combinations of, of sugar and fat, and they have to stick to this ketogenic approach. And for whatever reason, they've been able to consistently adhere to this diet for five years. Do you, do you think that there are some individuals that are just more predisposed to thrive on these approaches? Or, or how do we explain these phenomenons? So yeah, so that I actually don't think has anything to do with the construct of rigid or flexible restraint. Um, there was a paper that came out this year that was a really nice work of qualitative research looking at adherence to diets based on, um, you know, people's kind of associations and perceptions and, and kind of beliefs about the diet. And um, what was clear, the title of the paper was an important part of who I am. And I found that really, really striking and really telling. Um, those, you know, the carnivore keto diets, you know, people aren't adhering to that because it's anything to do with rigid restraints in my, and they're benefiting belief system. They, they're, they're wholly pot committed to essentially what amounts to religious belief in their diet and the superiority of it and the moral superiority of it. We see the same in the vegan and plant-based community as well. It's the same psychological construct. It's just playing out in different forms in terms of what people are eating. But these are very much belief system driven values and principles. So people in that area are not considering that they're adhering to a diet because to them, the diet is them. It's part of their self construct. It's part of their self identity. You know, they have it in their handle. You know, <laughs> keto, doc, carnivore, MD, whatever. So, you know, this this is this is ideological, uh, ad, uh, you know, belief based, belief driven adherence to a dogma um, that has very little to do, I, in my opinion, with kind of these other constructs of restraint and and, and rigidity and anything like that. Fascinating. To I think a a less considered area when it comes to this topic of discussion, and that is the the role of a support group. Um, mm. What what have you seen in the research in regard to the these intensive uh, lifestyle interventions? Do we do we see differences in success? If the individuals in these interventions have have a group of people that they're able to interact with who are going through the same process as them, does that tend to have a positive effect on long term success? Yeah, and it's one of the most consistent trials that have produced really significant long term weight loss maintenance. The look ahead diabetes trial is a really good example for this because at the outset there was a group of uh, participants who lost over 10% of their initial body weight and at eight years, the guts of a decade, up to 40 plus percent of that group had maintained over 10% of their initial weight loss. And when they were doing the eight year follow up and, and publishing the correlations with, you know, behaviors and otherwise, the ones who most consistently attended any of the uh, support sessions that were offered for participants were the ones with the strongest uh, correlation of, of maintained weight loss. And the look ahead intervention was very intensive. They had multiple 
in-person contacts every month plus additional follow-up by phone or email even for the over the four to eight years they were still able to avail of of, of in-person um you know counseling it was multimodal uh, behavior therapy dietetics the works so it was to me quite clear from that plus other interventions that have looked at you know the level of or the relationship between the outcomes and the number of practitioner contacts. So this seems to be pretty consistent. And, and I think that speaks to something quite important in the practitioner client relationship and how that can in and of itself be the driving kind of force that someone needs because they're getting individualized attention they're, you know, they have someone that they can, that can maybe relate to their struggles and, and, and troubleshoot things with them. They're not alone. Maybe they're also in a context where they, they, they have other people who are all going through the same thing. So I think that's one of the factors that emerges from the research that is really under discussed. Um, and in many respects, if we're genuinely talking about sustained long-term maintenance, could be really the crux of the issue. The more intensive, the more, the greater the number of practitioner contacts, um, the more frequent and regular those contacts, and the more that people attend to them, uh, the more that there is, it appears, a significant increase in the likelihood of them actually being successful in weight loss and in maintenance over the long term. Yeah, I think this point is, is so important because as a dietitian, and I'm sure you're you're aware of this as well. People people will come to you for for the answer, and they think I just come to this dietitian, I'll pay for one session, and and he'll give me the diet, he'll give me the exercise regime, and this will lead to my success. They they don't consider the potential of, of the relationship that you form, the the accountability and support that you get from this professional who perhaps might be trained in, in motivational interviewing and mm. the training of change and, and assessing their situation. And they don't they don't really see the value in these frequent counseling sessions. They just want the plan and then they'll they'll conduct it themselves. But when we look at these successful interventions in the research setting, as you just outlined, the these interactions, these, you know, whether that be through Facebook or, you know, frequent check-ins through email and this and that. These are all extremely important variables for getting these positive long-term outcomes. Right, yeah. And, and, and we're often not really considering all of these additional layers because we're so focused in the research and otherwise on the dietary side. What's, will, this, will diet A be better than diet B? Will this characteristic of diet A be better than this characteristic of diet B? And I think we're at a point where we need to just evolve the conversation a little bit to a point where that's really one of the last places that you get to because it's simply not a reflection of the importance of it to the desired outcomes and really as an emphasis on, um, you know, yeah, practitioner contacts, facilitating behavior change, um, engaging with someone at the level that they're at in terms of their readiness for change, and focusing on, you know, outcome goal, behavior goals as opposed to outcome goals, and all this kind of stuff that that's there in the research, you know, and it's it's not like we need to go really digging. It's we're not talking about some niche findings in some random secondary analysis. This is all sitting there 30 years worth of, of research that can be coalesced into practical and effective um, uh, behaviors uh, and we still are obsessed with the diet <laughs> so yeah I think I think we need to get over diet and, 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 and come to the reality of what will actually help people uh, you know get get to where they need to go yeah and 
perhaps you know the the popular media is largely to blame right if you walk into a bookstore or if you turn on you know the news or whatever it, it's always the headline about you know this recent study found that keto resulted in this amount of weight loss or whole food plant based led to this or vegan is, is the key to you know unlocking that that weight loss mm-hmm. success and keeping it off long term but you, you never see you never see the book you never see the headline that's like oh uh you know uh monthly counseling sessions for 24 months <laughs> led to a weight loss of, of you know 20 pounds right. and maintain that weight loss for you know the next the next few years yeah yeah exactly so that's yeah, that, that that kind of myopic reductionism on um, the diet weight loss relationship is just something that we I think are at a point where we can we can evolve from, you know, we can evolve to an emphasis on the composite of behaviors um, as, as opposed to the, the focus on the fads essentially is what you're describing is that like industry fed and supported narrative of like the magic pill, the magic diet, this supplement, blah, blah, blah. And and I think, you know, yeah, for people in the general population, you know, that haven't done science degrees or studied nutrition or art dietitian, like it it's that that, you know, you're getting this through the mediums that you would otherwise get your your information. Like this is not some random weird little health food shop that some hippie runs that is just selling you know, nonsense. This, this is mainstream TV, marketing, media. Like, uh, so all of the channels that people are are getting their information from. You know, look at the tragic success of Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop. You know, that that alone is 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 just such a tragedy that that that, that that's where people would get health information from and be led so far astray from any sort of path that's useful and effective so uh, yeah i think the industry that's built up around dieting and fad diets and supplements and everything is is a big part of the noise that that is difficult for people to cut through to a bit more of a science-based reality it, it really is intriguing how we can have access to more information than ever and be more confused than ever as a society yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I was thinking about that recently in the context of COVID and just, you know, how the whole thing has been such a, a damning indictment of, of the West, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, in, 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 in Asia, they've just sort of got on with the business of dealing with a pandemic and, you know, trust your public health authorities because they're actually doing the right thing and everyone wears we're all like it's 5g man <laughs> it's like you're trying to vaccinate me it's just like no so i think i uh i think nutrition falls in this weird place that we've got to with social media misinformation disinformation and, and we're seeing it manifest in in ever crazier diet tribes like the, the for me the car the emergence of the carnivore diet is 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 a, is is just a, a damning indictment of critical thinking skills in in the average individual, um, and I, I I I put and and here's the interesting thing: these it's not inseparable from these wider issues because when, for example, when COVID came came started to emerge, it was all the like low carb carnivore doctors who were all the conspiracy. They're the ones that are all you know LDL cholesterols a uh, a lie, pharma wants to give you statins. So they've got this conspiracy going on. And then they were the ones that were denying that COVID was real or denying, you know, that there was any risk or that if you were metabolically healthy, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was just like, so it's this clustering of crazy thinking, you know, with diet at a centerpiece. And, you know, for the amount of time that people are spending online, now it's not just the, the ad for the skinny tea on the side of the bus that someone was looking at. You know, it's it's someone with the purported authority of, you know, a medical degree or otherwise on social media telling them that the cure to all of their ailments is to literally only eat meat. Um, so we're in a weird place now with nutrition and diet, and I, I don't know where it's going. I do know 
it won't end well. Um, but yeah, I think that's part of the overall landscape of of confusion. I, I've seen these correlations as well when it comes to the diet an individual selects and then their viewpoints on, on many current events. It it again right. There's no other way to describe it except fascinating. And yeah. a, as you mentioned, it's because, you know, their diet becomes part of their identity and it, and it just it completely shapes their their way about how they think about everything. And that manifests into ev every facet of their existence. Mm -hmm. If we if we look at if we try to to sum up our power rankings here on these uh, lifestyle interventions that we're seeing in the research setting, it seems like at the top we have this support group, these th behavior change, uh, mm -hmm. counseling with a nutrition professional or a therapist, mm -hmm. and you know frequently doing these sorts of things. That that's going to account for a large part of our success, and then. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, you know, uh, way below those, we have more about the nuts and bolts and activity. It's it's good to remain relatively active as this can, you know, expend some energy, but also mm -hmm. have a positive effect on hunger, which we outlined in the beginning. Uh, hunger, this physiological consequence is likely to be a, a pretty significant barrier to maintaining this weight loss in the long term. So anything mm -hmm. that can help manage that, whether it be exercise or these nutrition considerations that we mentioned being uh, higher protein intake, higher fiber, incorporating a, a larger amount of non-starchy, voluminous vegetables, these mm -hmm. can all help. And then when it comes to the specific diet you select, you know, whether your team uh, one meal a day, intermittent fasting, or team, whole food, plant-based, or keto, it, do it doesn't really seem like it makes right. a difference. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. E yeah. Excellent. Um, at, as we look into a another realm of this long-term weight loss maintenance success research, outside of these uh, specific lifestyle interventions, we, we have the National Weight Control Registry, right, which is uh, just kind of a, a broad overview of people who have lost a bunch of weight, have maintained most of that weight loss for an extensive period of time, and just, just looking at the habits of these individuals. So, uh, you know, a bit less control, but but nonetheless, this is some pretty practical information that a consumer can look at and perhaps apply to their own lifestyle. If, if we look at this database of individuals and the the common things that they tend to do, what what's successful amongst this population? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing about the National Weight Control Registry is that, you know, it's relying on self-reporting. And so it's probably self-selecting for a particular type of, of person um, uh, so that, you know, that, 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 that obviously is engaged in all of these behaviors. And, and so it, it has the potential to be slightly biased to those behaviors that are reported on by people who would be you know, highly engaged. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it is a caveat. Um, but there's a few things that emerge, uh, you know, high levels of physical activity, as we've discussed, is one. One that's more controversial is regular weighing. Um, and people who regularly weigh and monitor their weight tend to, in terms of this data, um, have, you know, better long-term uh, maintenance, um, you know, People now, in terms of in the last few years, there's been a lot of focus on the behavioral and psychological aspects of, of dieting or consequences, unintended consequences. So there, there will be people that will argue that that's actually a really negative behavior and that it's disordered or, or otherwise. I, I don't know that we can make a hard and fast black and white claim in, in either direction. So there are clearly people for whom it isn't any sort of maladaptive behavior. Um, the question is, is whether it is a maladaptive behavior. And if it is, then, you know, weighing oneself is not going to be a, a good thing to do. Um, nonetheless, if we, if we assume that in individual, certain individuals, it's not maladaptive, then it does appear to be um, an effective behavior because it consistently has quite a high correlation in the NWCR. Um, and so, you know, you're talking about there's been correlations with sleep duration as well. That's a bit more difficult to kind of put a handle on in, in terms of um, because sleep is getting into a whole complex other kind of area. So, yeah, you, you tend to see these kind of like general 
healthy lifestyle habits that correlate around, you know, high levels of physical activity, uh, ve uh, vegetable and fruit consumption, uh, regular weighing, assuming it's not maladaptive. Um, and it ironically, again, all comes back to largely lifestyle behaviors uh, as opposed to anything specific really to do with any any type of diet. I think it's interesting, this this potential bias that you bring up, because from my understanding as well, when we look at the behaviors of the individuals in this registry, we see uh, diligence in just overall tracking, right? They, they tend to use some sort of point system or specifically track their calories. And then they also tend to keep tabs on their body weight. And you mentioned earlier how there are individuals within the fitness industry who are highly involved who think, well, I, well, I track calories, I track macros and, you know, I weigh myself regularly and I can lose a bunch of weight. So, so why can't you? And they think that just extrapolates to the general population, right. but that that's not necessarily the case. And the same can apply for this registry, which perhaps at, at face value, people might think is more so for the general population, but perhaps not. So it could be a little more biased than we might expect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's just it's just important to kind of yeah bear that in mind that maybe they're not representative of of the kind of average uh, person in the population that needs to lose weight and maybe because it is you know people who are successful that are that are reporting um, you know it's it's a sample of people that are in fact highly motivated and engage in all these behaviors and, and blah 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 so yeah it's just something to, something to bear in mind but there is still useful data to, to be taken from it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just do think that it is, you know, critical uh, to to emphasize that point because I do see a mm -hmm. lot a lot of people that they kind of they, they put this data first in this discussion. You know, they they like look look at all of the behaviors from these people in a national weight control registry. They are the most successful at losing weight and keeping it off. So we should look at this first rather than some of the more uh, intensive controlled trials that we discussed prior to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even the trials themselves, you know, they're they're. Uh, is likely to be a spectrum of people within that that are are at, at different stages of change and and all of this and yeah uh, has done a poor job as a field of of doing better to you know most interventions just quantify baseline differences or characteristics as you know gender anthropometric blah, blah, blah. and despite the fact that we've known since the early 90s that you know high levels of dietary restraint will predict rebound weight gain people aren't screened before entry into an intervention for behaviors that relate to diet i, I find that a real failing of the research community in in in, in nutrition um you know and in, in obesity research um so yeah that's that's a bit of a bee in the bonnet. I think we could have potentially produced much better success rates if you were able to uh, to do that and, and to screen for people appropriately, and not just better success rates, but less harm would would have been done. You know, because it it is a it is harm to put people in an intervention who have a poor relationship with food, multiple weight loss attempts, and all of these factors that correlate with with negative outcomes and re with rebound weight gain. Um, that's that's putting people. We we seem to assume in the research community that weight loss is a benign intervention and that it's just applicable to everyone in all circumstances. And it's not. It it is an intervention, and no intervention, whether it's a drug or a diet, is is ever risk free. And we have, you know, the wider nutrition research community has really failed in assessing risk for diet as an intervention and and perhaps screening more appropriately accordingly. I love that perspective because, you know, we we look at the the baseline characteristic of the subject and it's like, oh, this is the BMI and this and that. It's like, well, if we have if we have 200 subjects, you know, I'm curious, where are they all at? in their journey what right. state what stage of change are they in just the fact that they want to enter a study means they're at least contemplating 
right. changing their lifestyle, right? And for that reason, and we consider this this global problem, right, of of these uh, this incremental rising in overweight and obesity, you know, a lot of these people aren't considering any change at all to their lifestyle. So, mm-hmm. you know, how, how do we reach them? How do we get them to change? And then we look at, you know, these things like the National Weight Control Registry, where these people are even past contemplation. They're all about it. They're on board. Right. Yeah. You know, They're it's, doing it's it a all. very specific. Yeah. 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 It's a very distinct psychological state these people are in and we can't necessarily extrapolate that to to the general population and fixing the the problem at large right exactly so it's it comes back to yeah more appropriate um extrapolation and and not over extrapolating findings of any one given study or otherwise um and, and being really accurate with, with, with our thinking in terms of, you know, where a given intervention might be applicable, who it's applicable for, um, you know, and all of those other kind of additional factors that we have to think about in terms of taking the results of one study or multiple studies um, and, and placing them in the context that they need to be placed in, in terms of wider kind of population health. Absolutely. Alan, this brings us into my final question for you, which is uh, something that I, I've been consistently asking my guests on the show. I'm trying to create an, an informal meta-analysis of sorts, uh, you know, the perspective of some of the, the brightest minds in the nutrition field. And so for you, my question is, when we look at this global problem, these rates of overweight and obesity and the statistical models which seem to predict that it's only going to get worse we're not we're not going in the right direction where where have we failed should we be shifting our research focus to another area is is there an area of research which we haven't done a good job of highlighting that we need to spend more time with what are your thoughts here where where should we be stepping next yeah, so I, I think it's become, for me anyway, um, I'm based on, you know, a huge amount of data at this point. It's, it's, it's become so obvious that the issues that we're facing really never had anything to do with diet. They do. But I think we are better recharacterizing diet as a symptom. And, and what it's a symptom of is you know, an increasingly neoliberal free market economic model that has, so people say, oh, it's the dietary guidelines that was introduced in the 1970s. They're the reason it's like, well, actually, if you look what really shifted in the 1970s, you know, it was the prevailing economic doctrine in, in, in a lot of countries, particularly the US and the UK, you can almost look and chart and as some, as some research groups have, the rates of, of, of chronic lifestyle disease, overweight and obesity correlate so strongly with those extremes of, of, of kind of free market economics and, you know, wealth disparity within a society is the greatest driver of health disparity. Countries with low wealth disparity have much less health disparity and all of these issues in terms of the the diets that are essentially on people's plates on a day-to-day basis are majority socioeconomically and environmentally driven. Um, We have reversed a situation where historically uh, lower socioeconomic quintiles of society would have been prone to food vulnerability and insecurity. They still are. But they're also prone to, for the first time ever, be able to massively overconsume energy intake for essentially the lowest possible cost. And these are the issues that are that are facing us. We have areas, particularly in urban uh, areas, that are f- food deserts is the term. There is not a a supermarket selling fresh vegetables or fruit. There is, here's just a, an example. I know a lot of your listeners may be in the US, but the same broadly applies. 
uh, there was a study last year in the UK that looked at the density of four major fast food outlets, so McDonald's, KFC, Burger King, and a chicken shack. The density of, of each of those outlets, all four, relative to quintiles of social deprivation, and in the areas of greatest social deprivation, there was the greatest concentration of all of them. This isn't an accident. And so I think we need to start having a really hard conversation about the reality that the diet that we are producing or industry is producing and the marketing that they're using to get people to consume these diets are largely targeting the most vulnerable people in society. And it's at that level that we tend to see the greatest in cardiovascular, diabetes, chronic lifestyle disease risk overall. So I think we need to recharacterize this as a socioeconomic problem and start to think about regulation in the same way that there was a huge fight to eventually get the tobacco industry to behave somewhat responsibly, we now have to accept that the most logical analogy that we have for the food environment is that the food industry is the, the, the what to 2020, what the tobacco industry was to 1960. We have to treat emissions in the same way as these products are going out that are incredibly harmful for human health. They're, they're marketed to kids as, 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 as young as one to two years of age. Like th this is everything that's, that's wrong with, with the free market if there are no checks and balances in place. And so that's where we would make significantly more strides in a shorter period of time than, than 100 more years of research onto different diets and nutrients and foods. Um, so yeah, that's me, my, what, my little socioeconomic soapbox. I'll get off, I'll get off the soapbox now. <laughs> that was a captivating statement, Alan. I think those words were extremely powerful and I couldn't agree more, but that's all I have for you today. That does it for a, another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Alan, for listeners who want to go and support you, where can we point them towards? Uh, yeah, a fairly, a fairly narrow, um, kind of trio. I really only one social media account. So that's on Instagram at the nutritional underscore advocate. Uh, you can find me at my own website, which is alineannutrition.com. Um, and that's a science, uh, research review focused website and put out a weekly review of a study. Um, it goes quite in depth. And you can also find me at Sigma Nutrition, uh, where I produce uh, written statements on various issues. And myself and Danny uh, do a monthly, uh, we're recording bi-weekly now, podcast. So they're the kind of three main, main places people will find me. Excellent. And all of those links will be in the show notes. I, I strongly encourage everyone to check them out. That does it for another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Thank you so much for listening, everyone.